Ja, schönen guten Abend, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen zu der heutigen Lecture. Ähm, eine Lecture außerhalb unserer normalen Lecture-Reihe, die ähm, in diesem Jahr, also diesem Semester und im nächsten Semester Pier Paolo Pasolini ähm, gewidmet ist. Ähm, aber auch dieser Abend heute ist ähm, in Kooperation mit der Goethe-Universität ähm, der Filmwissenschaft. Und ähm, ja, es war eine besondere Ge äh, Gelegenheit, da ähm, zur Zeit ähm, ähm, John McElhaney ähm, aus New York hier zu Gast ist und ähm, eine Vortragsreihe an der Uni gemacht hat. Und ähm, genau bei der Gelegenheit natürlich ist es schön, ihn hier auch im Kino zu haben für eine besondere Lecture mit Film. Und ähm, ich möchte auch Adrian Martin begrüßen, ähm, auch ebenfalls Gastprofessor hier an der Goethe-Universität, ähm, der jetzt gleich ähm, John Gilhani vorstellen wird. Und ähm, ja, auch er war schon häufiger Gast hier im Kino und hat selber Lectures gehalten. Heute Abend er ähm, genau in Funktion seinen Kollegen äh, zu begrüßen. Okay, Adrian Martin. Hello. Thank you, Natasha, and, and thanks to the Film Museum for, for hosting this event. It's a great honour for me and for Goethe University to have Professor Joe McElhaney here uh, from New York. Uh, he's been part of a week of events at the university uh, in which he's given talks and participated in classes. Um, uh, I, I personally chose uh, Joe to be uh, a guest of the university and of the theatre, film and media studies department this year uh, because I'm a big fan uh, of his work. I'm an enormous admirer of what he has achieved uh, in his critical writing and also, as I've seen this week, uh, in his teaching, in his ability to, uh, to involve people in the adventure uh, of film analysis. Uh, a few of the, uh, the, of the facts about Joe is that he's a professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies at Hunter College and in the theatre program at the City University of New York Graduate Centre. Uh, he is the author of the books The Death of Classical Cinema, Hitchcock, Lang, Minnelli, and that was published in 2006, and he also wrote Albert Maisel's in 2009. Uh, and Joe has also contributed to two very important books that he's edited, a book on Vincente Minnelli called The Art of Entertainment uh, and a book that is, uh, will be coming out over the next few months, which is a companion to Fritz Lang. One of the, the uh, articles uh, more than 10 years ago that, that really drew my attention to Joe's work and, and made me want to seek him out was an article that he wrote about uh, Vincente Minnelli and particularly on the film, uh, late 1950s film, called Some Came Running. Uh, and he, in, a, in an article that was published online in the Danish magazine 169, uh, an article called Medium Shot Gestures, he took what for me was a very surprising approach to this film by Minnelli because we think of Minnelli as one of those Hollywood directors who's very flamboyant, garish, highly coloured and so on. And But what Joe said is, well, we're not really going to understand this film, Some Came Running by Minnelli, if we concentrate on these occasional moments of flamboyance. What we really need to look at are more ordinary moments in the film, more ordinary uh, exchanges. And in that article he says that one problem that arises in writing about a scene in Some Came Running is that traditional shot-by-shot -shot close analysis, even if it works for Hitchcock, Lang and Eisenstein, it produces extremely limited results for somebody like Vincente Minnelli. He was a director notorious for his fanatical attention to decor, but what is often revealing about Minnelli's films is how uninteresting the individual shots are in freeze frame. What finally gives Minnelli's images their significance is how the actors are brought into these frames, how the actors move, speak and gesture as part of a process of unfolding motion and dynamic interaction. It is not so much the shot that interests Minnelli uh, as the frame. And at the end of this article, uh, Joe comes around to, to his conclusion that he says, it might be best to see Minnelli as a filmmaker who presupposes a spectator capable of looking at images that are rich, detailed and often theatrical in terms of composition and staging of action. 
from that point, Joe's own work has, has evolved in, in, in various directions and he's looked at extremely classical filmmakers, Hollywood filmmakers such as Minnelli, such as Preston Sturgis, such as Douglas Sirk, which is uh, part of his topic tonight. Uh, and he's also looked at, at modern cinema, for instance, the films of Fassbinder. But one of the things that I admire most about Joe's work is, as he told us this week, he, he's not into abstractions. Uh, he doesn't begin from an abstract idea and then try to find that abstract idea illustrated in a film, which is what so many of us do. Uh, rather, he tries to begin from the details and he begins richly from, from the details of how actors move, uh, how shots are framed, how the camera moves, how things work, but not necessarily in, in an ostentatious or flamboyant way. He values flamboyance too, but he's also interested in everything that is, that is intimate, that can be overlooked, uh, that is easily not seen in, in the work uh, of, of a great film director, such as Douglas Sirk or, or Vincente Minnelli. Tonight's uh, uh, presentation by Joe is, is about uh, an actor, uh, Barbara Stanwyck. Uh, and it's partly about uh, her, her collaboration with a number of directors that Joe will speak about, one of whom is, is Douglas Sirk. And this is, I think, it relates to work that, Joe is, uh, the work that Joe is doing at the moment on the human figure in motion in film. And particularly, we could say, an attention to, to performance, to gesture, to the detail of what it is that actors do and how it is that, the, in some ways, the mystery of how actors and directors collaborate, how they produce the, the, the thing that is finally the film, and what we can learn by really attending very closely to the details of the figure in motion in film. So let's now welcome warmly Joe McElhaney. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for that very generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, Barbara Stanwyck, German actress, question uh, mark. There is a sequence from Douglas Sirk's film, All I Desire, which you'll be seeing very soon, in which the protagonist, Naomi, Mur Naomi Murdoch, stands outside of her former home and observes through windows and screen doors the dinnertime activities of the husband and children she had walked out on years earlier. Naomi left her family in order to pursue a career as an actress, but she also left due to social pressure, a woman who failed to successfully integrate herself into a small town existence and a middle-class marriage. However, her career as an actress has also been a failure, and she's returning home partly because her options in life are running out. The pathos of such a moment has an inherent power apart from any specifics of cinematic execution. But it's precisely these specifics that demand our attention. The sequence in All I Desire I'm referring to and the film as a whole have received a great deal of first-rate commentary from such critics as Michael Walker, V.F. Perkins, Andrew Clevin, and Adrian Martin. My concerns here, though, are twofold. One is that it is Barbara Stanwyck who is portraying Naomi Murdoch, also a concern of Clevin's in his excellent study of the actress, although his, the nature of his concerns are somewhat different from my own, and that a very particular kind of director is behind the camera. That director is Douglas Sirk, born, born Detlef, Detlef Sirk in 1897, and a successful film and stage director in Germany before he left that country or rather this country, uh, in 1937. He eventually settled in America, where he became a commercially viable director in Hollywood, in particular for a series of melodramas that he turned out at Universal in the 1950s. Uh, All, of All I Desire is one of these Universal melodramas, although it is, apparently was not a terribly successful film at the box office. Uh, his star in All I Desire, on the other hand, came from a markedly different background. She was born Ruby Stevens in 1907, to working class Brooklyn parents who died while Stanwyck was still a child and Stanwyck spent much of her childhood living in foster homes. Stanwyck spent much of her early years as a showgirl and dancer and eventually became a successful Broadway actress and her success on Broadway brought her to the attention of Hollywood and she went out there in 1930 and uh, actually 1928, 29 and by 1930 
uh, she had a breakthrough role in a film of Frank Capra's called Ladies of Leisure. And this essentially made her a film star. By 1953, though, and typical of many female stars of her generation, um, she was no longer quite the top figure in Hollywood that she had once been. Even though she has star billing over the title in All I Desire, the production circumstances on this film were considerably reduced from those of Stanwyck's heyday in the 30s and 40s. Uh, and uh, while well, her situation in real life was not remotely comparable to Naomi Murdoch's that you'll see at the beginning of the film, uh, some of Naomi's lines that you'll hear early in the film in voiceover narration may have resonated with Stanwyck uh, in some ways. Uh, Naomi says, not quite at the bottom of the bill yet, and not quite at the end of my rope. Nevertheless, the collaboration between Stanwyck and Cirque appears to have been uh, a creatively productive one, at least for Cirque. They would make one more film together, There's Always Tomorrow, in 1956. In later years, Cirque was fulsome in his praise for Stanwyck, declaring her to be, quote, more expressive than any actress I ever worked with, end quote. A year before All I Desire, Stanwyck would make Clash by Night, which deals with a similar narrative situation of a woman of a certain age, here named Mae Doyle, who returns after ten year, also after 10 years away, uh, to the small town of her origins, not on a note of triumph, but as a gesture of defeat. For obvious reasons, these two films, Clash by Night and All I Desire, uh, have been linked. But something else links them, apart from the similarity of narrative situation and the fact that they both star the same actress. Uh, Clash by Night was directed by a major figure of German cinema. In fact, uh, a far more important one uh, than Douglas Sirk, uh, Fritz Lang. Austrian-born, seven years Sirk senior, and during the Weimar period, the most innovative filmmaker in Germany, along with Murnau and Pabst. Like Cirque, Lang eventually came to Hollywood, although he arrived earlier in 1935 and quickly acquired a reputation as a strong-willed and tyrannical figure, often alienating his casts and crews. Uh, Lang's experience with Stanwyck, though, was uh, similar to Cirque's. Working with Barbara Stanwyck, Lang later declared, was one of the greatest experiences of my, one of the greatest pleasures of my career. She's fantastic, unbelievable, and I liked her tremendously. Now that kind of praise is not uncommon from Cirque's director, excuse me, from Stanwyck's directors, and it runs across the history of her career. Uh, my interest in this matter, though, is much more focused, both in terms of uh, the historical moment being addressed and the kinds of films Stanwyck is making. The names Lang and Cirque evoke a very particular idea of cinema and a very particular idea of the filmmaker. Clash by Night and All I Desire are, in terms of setting, very American. Small town Wisconsin in the latter, the Pacific Northwest in the former. However, the visual and dramatic traditions from which these directors emerged are strongly tied to a formalism with its roots in European and more specifically German cultural traditions. However varied its specifics in Lang and Cirque are as different from one another as they are similar. This pr approach left little room for spontaneity, and the actor often functioned as part of a predetermined, predetermined set of elements. Even though All I Desire may seem, on the surface, like a fairly typical female-centered small-town melodrama of the period, the kind routinely turned out by Hollywood at this time, on closer examination, it's a film of rigorous formal causality with insistent visual and dramatic relations, parallels, doublings, intricate spatial configurings, stagings, and in which the iconic and symbolic image becomes part of the film's structuring principle. In Hollywood, refugee and immigrant filmmakers from Germany and Eastern Europe had been part of a steady influx beginning in the 1920s, and then due to the rise of Nazism, this accelerated in the 1930s. Cirque was, in fact, among the last of these to arrive. Uh, however productive this talent was for reimagining the forms and implications of Hollywood cinema, uh, this presence in Hollywood of these German filmmakers was also a source of frequent tension, both formally and in terms of the production circumstances of the film. Um, in Maximilian Schell's 1984 documentary on Marlena Dietrich called Marlena, Dietrich, uh, hardly a stranger to working within rigorous formalist environments, uh, complains of how the actors on Lang's Rancho Notorious had to precisely hit a set of marks laid out for them on the floor. Uh, a vivid, although probably exaggerated, testimony to working within this kind of uh, environment. From a distance, Stanwyck would not appear to be a likely candidate 
for a smooth collaboration with these filmmakers. Capra, for example, has famously stated that Stanwyck was such a natural that her first takes were always the best. And so consequently, he would use multiple cameras on the sets uh, of their films together in order to capture the spontaneity on the first take. And Stanwyck's frequently remarked upon natural style of performance, of which the spontaneity was one of its crucial elements, uh, was immediately recognized in the 1930s for its expressiveness during a period when there was an increased fascination for less telegraphic methods of acting. Spencer Tracy, arriving in Hollywood at about the same time, would be her approximate male counterpart. But Tracy's volatile relationship with Lang on the set of Fury, Lang's first American film, stands in marked contrast to uh, Stanwyck's relationship with Fritz Lang on the set of Clash by Night. Even allowing for the fact that the Lang of 1952 might have been less cantankerous than the Lang of 1936 on Fury, um, well, the Dietrich's anecdote would suggest otherwise, since Rancho Notorious and Clash by Night were in fact made the same year. Um, there is something revealing about this disparity in the experiences of these two actors in dealing with Lang. Now, one could also conceivably argue that Stanwyck simply developed more technique over the years, so that by 1952 she was uh, ready and able to deal with the likes of a Fritz Lang. So, what was it, though, that allowed for Stanwyck to so memorably, so indelibly collaborate and participate in the films of not only Cirque and Lang, but also the films of other German and Eastern European artists in Hollywood in the 40s and 50s. And why should this even be of interest? When Stanwyck received her American Film Institute Lifetime Achievement Award in 1987, she began her speech by praising Frank Capra for, for, for teaching her what, as she put it, what film was all about. Because he took her into the editing room, the property room, and showed her the entire process of filmmaking. Anecdotes about Stanwyck's professionalism abound, as do anecdotes about the movie star who was on a first name basis with the crews. And uh, it was precisely this kind of informality, this first name basis with the crews, that horrified Howard Hawks, who directed her in Ball of Fire. Hawks felt that movie stars should remain politely aloof from this kind of atmosphere. Um, now, what I see here in Stanwyck's desire to be on this first name basis with the cast and crew, to essentially get along with everyone, uh, is on the one hand, certainly uh, this need to work within a happy, collaborative atmosphere to create an alternative work environment for herself on these films. But I also see something else, uh, which is a need to fully absorb herself in the process of filmmaking, to become, in effect, the film. Another major German refugee filmmaker, Robert Siodmak has described Stanwyck's presence on the set of his film, The File and Thelma Jordan, from 1950 in this way. He says, before we started shooting, she would be sitting in her chair, her eyes closed, and her concentration would be focused on the scene she was to play. The makeup and wardrobe people would be working to get her ready, but she never looked in the mirror. Completely absorbed in her work, she would go without a word in front of the camera. So here a standard form of actor's concentration comes close to a form of auto-hypnosis. Stanwyck oblivious even to her own physical appearance as she, in a sense, sees the film in her mind before she walks onto the set itself. The interest then, I think, of Stanwyck's collaborations with these refugees from Germany's film industry and her compatibility with their working methods is not simply the result of her, of her professionalism and adaptability. What I would like to pursue here is how Stanwyck enacts and implies certain possibilities in relation to cinematic metaphor. Well, such a reading of the cinema and conceiving of the cinema is not utterly unique to German filmmakers of the Weimar period. It's nevertheless one of the cinema's dominant strategies, achieving a particular explicitness in the work of Fritz Lang with its persistent allegorizing of vision. While not addressing this specific issue, Andrew Clevin notes that looking is an important part of Stanwyck's acting and that few actors use their eyes so attentively to observe and survey others in the world. Now, Clevin is not discussing Stanwyck's work with Cirque or Lang here. He's talking about Ladies of Leisure, her first film with Frank Capra, which suggests that Stanwyck's capacity to observe and survey the world around her was being articulated from the beginning of her career. Such a capacity for looking on Stanwyck's part is not simply a matter of localized effects, of facial expression or making eye contact with her fellow players. Even before her collaborations with German directors, Stanwyck is situated in her films as a type of viewer. 
One of the most frequently analyzed images from her body of work is from the Lady Eve in 1941, in which she um, is, her character of Jean is sitting on a luxury liner and holding up a, a hand mirror. And as she's holding up this hand mirror, she's looking at all these men, all these women trying to gain the attention of Charles Pike, played by Henry Fonda. And as they're walking by, she has this running commentary uh, as she's holding up this mirror. Uh, Clevin perceptibly notes that in this at this moment, she is rather like, uh, this experience is rather like sitting next to Stanwyck in a movie theater as she's, uh, as he puts it, we are at a, quote, private and pri privileged screening of a predictable film with a cliched story and characters, end quote. But why would Stanwyck, more than any other contemporaneous female star, be so often enacting this role of the viewer? Regardless of the number of films in which Stanwyck portrayed an upper-class woman, her image remained most indelibly linked with her own real-life working-class background. To be on the outside looking in, because one does not economically or socially belong, is at the center of the final sequence of King Vidor's Stella Dallas from 1937, perhaps the most analyzed and debated sequence in all of Stanwyck's cinema. But Stanwyck's social exclusion here also transforms her into a spectator. Now, as others have noted in analyzing this sequence, the window that she looks through this townhouse, through which Stella observes her daughter being married, serves as a type of screen from which Stella is barred physical entry, literally through the fence that cuts across the frame, but also through the class divisions that are central to the film. The final sequence is, in fact, I think, a revisiting of a sequence early in the film in which Stella is taken on a date to the movies with her future husband, Stephen. I want to take a look at that sequence now from Stella Dallas. Now, the film's trajectory, I'm sure many of you have seen this film, uh, however, makes it clear that this world of well-bred and refined, uh, a fantasy partly fed by going to see films, uh, is perpetually out of Stella's reach, even when she has access to capital. All I Desire revisits certain elements of Stella Dallas, uh, in particular Naomi's references to herself being a girl from the, from the girl from across the tracks, who used to embarrass her bourgeois husband by being vulgar and laughing too loudly, exactly as the working class Stella did to her husband. And in Clash by Night, Mae Doyle is even shown literally crossing the railroad tracks at the beginning of the film as she returns to her family home. The sequence of Naomi's homecoming that I was referring to at the beginning of this talk uh, may be seen as an elaborate restaging of this class-based process of exclusion. Naomi watching her family through the doors and windows of what had once been her home offers a distilled version of Stanwyck's own extraordinary capacity for observing. Everything in this sequence that you'll be seeing very soon is determined by where Stanwyck looks and by her emotional responses to this moment. At the same time, Cirque never gives her a true point of view shot, and the framing, the light and shadow, and the decor in which the door and the window assume clear symbolic functions, all play on the idea of outside and inside of excluding her from the world she is viewing, even as the sequence itself is engendered precisely because she is viewing. It is just that I'm so tired of being on the outside looking in. This is not Naomi Murdoch speaking, nor is it Stella Dallas. It is Thelma Jordan, in a line uttered near the end of a monologue in which she describes to her new lover, a married attorney named Cleve Marshall, her long itinerant existence and desperate scramble for financial security which in this film will culminate in murder. She takes, she's in a car with her ex-lover. Uh, she doesn't want to go off with him, and she takes a cigarette lighter that's in the car as he, the man is driving, and she takes it and burns a hole into his eye with a cigarette lighter, and this causes the car to crash, which not only kills the lover, it also uh, results in her death. So it's a kind of murder-suicide that she's performing here. Uh, and Thelma Jordan enacts a constant in C. Max's work, the importance of observing from a long-held and deeply ingrained sense of being powerless. And when action is finally taken, it's because the pressure of merely observing has become unbearable. Thelma dies at the end of the film on a hospital stretcher with her eyes wide open. Nevertheless, the frequency with which Stanwyck is cast as a working class protagonist is not in and of itself enough to account for the intriguing fit between her and these German filmmakers. 
Joan Crawford, for example, often portrayed working class characters, but the metaphoric resonance that I'm tracing out here does not manifest itself with the same intensity, the same frequency as it does in Stanwyck. Possibly because Stanwyck spent the bulk of her career freelancing rather than being under contract to a single studio, uh, her image was uh, less stable. Uh, she was, in a sense, more exposed, less protected, but also more easily in a position to adapt to various highly diverse films and uh, uh, highly strong-willed and diverse filmmakers. At the same time, for Stanwyck simply to make a film with a German director will not automatically put cinematic metaphor into play. A network of elements must be in place in order for these films to resonate in this way. For example, neither William Dieterle's The Secret Bride from 1935 nor Curtis Bernhardt's My Reputation from 1946, while both Stanwyck films and both directed by German refugees lend themselves to such a reading. Both films possess interests, but the specific of Stanwyck are incidental to the two films, and one could imagine any number of other actresses in Hollywood at the time uh, playing these roles. It's become axiomatic to regard Double Indemnity, made when she was at the height of her stardom, as a pivotal film in altering certain ideas, uh, about Stanwyck's image, given the ruthless and unsympathetic nature of the character she's portraying in this film, Phyllis Diedrichsen. But Double Indemnity is also the first of her major collaborations with German filmmakers, in this instance, Billy Wilder. Diedrichsen, and the German-sounding last name is not in James McCain's source novel, is certainly an archetypal femme fatale. Due to her status in this regard, she has often been taken to be more spectacle than spectator. But Double Indemnity gives this archetype its own particular inflection. From the beginning of her career, Stanwyck was able to create the effect of an extremely disciplined body, marked by tense shoulders that seemed to just slightly precede Stanwyck as she moved through a space. In Double Indemnity, this is taken to a different level, as the indelible walk down the stairs of Phyllis Diedrichsen not only sets into motion the destiny of Walter Neff, it also turns this walk into a form of hypnotic control initiated by Phyllis, an image of movement that Neff is unable to get out of his mind like a cinematic image constantly being replayed. Spontaneous gesture and physical movement and double indemnity are subordinated to a conception of the human figure in which nothing is incidental, in which all movement becomes connected to death. Walter Neff looks at Phyllis, wants to see more, but it is her look, or more specifically, her control over the way that he looks at her, that's crucial here. It's as though Stanwyck in this film has taken the advice given to her character of Lily in a film she made in 1933 called Babyface, directed by Alfred Green. Uh, and in that earlier film, a German cobbler named Adolf Krag, explicitly taking his cue from Nietzsche's will to power, instructs Lily, whose last name is Powers, to be a master and not a slave, to use men for her own ends. As in much of Wilder, various modes of thought structure this film, intuition, deduction, itemizing, scheming, but there is also submitting to the will of others, freed from the burden of having to think at all, and capable of unexpectedly passing from the socialized world of law and civilization to the antisocial worlds of deception, crime, and death. Now, since the film's initial release, complaints about Walter Neff's attraction to Phyllis being implausible or insufficiently motivated have persisted. But these complaints ignore the degree to which Neff is, and for all of his uh, early ironic posturing, which you'll see in just a minute, is under a type of spell, as potent as anything devised by Dr. Mabuza. Phyllis's initial walk down the stairs, her way of crossing her legs as she sits, then rises and paces in front of him, sits down again and recrosses her legs in order to show off her anklet, mark the beginning of various methods she engages in for controlling Neff. She is, as James Nairmore has phrased it, a realist version of the seductive robot Maria in Lang's Metropolis, but with no male figure initiating and controlling this image. Let's take a look now at the double indemnity excerpt. Double indemnity? Yeah. Wonderful slow dissolve right there where this image of Phyllis is still in his mind uh, as he's driving the car away. The famous close-up later in the film of Phyllis in the driver's seat 
uh, as her husband, seated next to her, is being strangled from behind by Neff. Phyllis staring straight ahead in icy detachment has been interpreted in a number of different ways. But for my own purposes here, Phyllis does not look over at the murder because she doesn't have to. Like a highly disciplined artist who has created a scenario and set its mise-en-scene into motion, she already knows how it will look. At play at much of Stanwyck's cinema is a dialectic between viewing, or being viewed, and creating. Stella Dallas is not simply a passive victim of circumstances as she stands in the rain at the end of the film. She has, through her own capacity as the mature on sin of her daughter's future, willed herself into the position of ideal spectator at and creator of the wedding. And the culminating moment of Jean viewing the activities through the hand mirror in the Lady Eve is her calculated tripping of Pike, who from that point on will likewise be enmeshed in a scenario not of his own devising and created by Stanwyck's character, who, as Stanley Cavell has notably argued, may be seen as a stand-in for the role of a director. By the 50s, though, most of Stanwyck's German Hollywood films, most of, the, most of these German Hollywood filmmakers with whom Stanwyck was working, were free to return home to Europe, return home to Europe, to which all of them later did, although each under very different uh, circumstances. And this return was, for uh, most of them, not a notably happy one. All the films Stanwyck made with these directors during the decade were dominated by a sense of an impossible longing for a past that cannot be recaptured and a future that is at best uncertain, at worst, a point of despair, and in which the home becomes a nucleus around which certain cons much of these concerns revolve. Cirque saw in Stanwyck what he later called an inherent deep melancholy. In each of these German Hollywood films, home is both a literal space, a house, and a metaphor for displacement and failure. Home is where you come when you've run out of places, is the line Mae Doyle utters at the beginning of Clash by Night, as she drops a cigarette into a cup of coffee, giving clear voice to the ambivalence that is central to these German Hollywood films. Stanwyck is aging here, and time, a subject endlessly referred to in the films, is running out. Contrast this with most of her other roles during this period, in which she is much more firmly middle class or even more frequently linked with power and ownership, particularly central to her westerns, in which her age is not addressed or in which she is portraying a woman younger than what Stanwyck was in reality. Mitchell Lysen's film, No Man of Our Own, from 1950, is the most revealing of these other films as a point of contact and contrast. Adapted from a Cornell Woolrich novel, the film's narrative, dominated by ironic twists of fate, reversals, and replacements, and with Stanwyck playing a socially marginalized woman, is lying in wait for a German director. It even has an expression of sequence, in which Stanwyck is on a stretcher, wheeled into a hospital, and we see this through her eyes. But overall, Lysen's approach to the material naturalizes the film's environment and resists the iconic. Even more pointedly, the film never questions the bourgeois conception of home. Instead, we get a sentimentalized treatment of home and family, a world without any internal contradictions and repressiveness. No Man of Our Own is a film ultimately working at cross purposes from these other German Hollywood films of Stanwyck's. The Fallon Thelma Jordan is a transitional one of the group, and that Stanwyck returns to the femme fatale of double indemnity, but splits her open, betraying a woman who is, as she puts it, two people, and whose monologues and multiple confessions over the course of the film engage in ambiguous double registers of meaning, lying, truth-telling, a woman who is finally denied both a life of crime and a life of bourgeois respectability. Thelma Jordan looks back to Phyllis Diedrichson, but she also looks ahead to Naomi Murdoch and Mae Doyle. And throughout the film, Siad Mack uses doors, windows, hallways, spaces of transition that clearly serve as extensions of Thelma's perpetual state of not belonging. Siad Mack's work is haunted by the protagonist whose drives are split between two contradictory desires, and which often leads to a breaking down, a fragmenting of the individual into component parts running along parallel lines. In a memorable sequence from the file on Thelma Jordan, Thelma meets with her attorney after Thelma has been arrested for the murder of her elderly aunt, whose home she has moved into as a gesture of last resort. Circus describes Stanwyck's gift for, um, quote, getting every point, every nuance, without hitting on anything too heavily, end quote. Now, this would certainly conform uh, to the myth of Stanwyck's on-screen naturalness. However, in this sequence, we see Stanwyck's gift for turning facial expression and gesture into something that surpasses nuance 
and instead, in its economy of movement and detail, achieves an iconic force. The result is that the slightest movement of the eyes, turn of the head, use of the hands, assumes an indelible weight. But in both the explicitness of the dialogue and the echoing performance of Stanley Ridges as her attorney, pacing about as systematically as Phyllis Diedrichson, an ironic parallel is set up between Thelma and the cynical man who will be defending her. With their German Hollywood films of the 50s, one could find a certain impatience now with the position of being a spectator. And there's always tomorrow. Stanwyck's Norma attends the theater in Los Angeles with her former colleague Clifford Groves, Fred McMurray again, whom she has not otherwise seen in 20 years, and with whom she is still in love. Norma is a replacement date for Cliff's wife, too busy with the children to attend the theater with her husband. At intermission, Norma reminds Cliff that he took her to a matinee at the same theater 20 years earlier. You wanted me to see my first show direct from Broadway, she tells him. Cliff has, in a sense, taught Norma how to be a spectator, such a gesture central to her initial desire for him. But in fact, in terms of what this show is that they're seeing now, and there's always tomorrow, she's already seen this show in New York. Suggests leaving, and even though Cliff has not seen the show before, they go. Norma wants to see a space of work, she claims, but she also clearly wants to spend what little precious time she has now with him, visiting him in his workspace. Now, in the sequence prior to this, Cirque introduces Norma through a shot in which Cliff, left alone by his family, opens the door to his home to find Norma there, first in shadow and then stepping into light. What immediately follows is a miraculous one minute and 20 second piece of cinema. Estonic moves about the ground floor of his home. She takes everything in, her praise for the warm and cheerful house, her touching of objects, already being swallowed up by the irony of the shadows that she steps into and out of, and by the imagery of bars from the stairs and by room dividers. The words look and see are used five times in this brief sequence in which the conversation otherwise concerns itself with the passage of time. And Clevin has also noted in relation to Stanwyck's performance in this film uh, how Stanwyck's eye movements as she looks at Cliff create the effect of what Clevin calls a concentrated gaze that is admiring, inspecting, dissimulated, and calculated to capture his attention. It's almost a kind of reversal of the sequence he saw earlier from Double Indemnity. There's always tomorrow. Now, if one is getting older then, and the possibilities in life are narrowing down to very few, then one cannot just sit there any longer. Compare the film viewing sequence from Stella Dallas, that was seen earlier, with the one in Clash by Night, where Mae Doyle sits in the theater with her future husband, Jerry, watching a film and looking rather bored and detached. But where Stella Dallas takes us from the theater to the space of viewing to the street, where the film's magic can be sustained, Clash by Night takes us behind the scenes, not to the space of creation, the movie set, or the editing room, but to the space where the finished product comes to life, the projection booth. And here she meets Jerry's friend, the projectionist Earl, played by Robert Ryan, naively described by Jerry uh, to May as being in the movie business. Let's take a look at this scene. May Doyle may very well be the only protagonist in the history of cinema to become sexually aroused by a man because he is rewinding film. <laughs> As Earl simultaneously speaks of, of his desire to literally cut up the leading lady of the film he's projecting, May's eyes scan his body. In contrast to Stanwyck in the Cirque films, though, May Doyle spends much of this film looking off, looking away. But as Earl never tires of reminding May, he and she are mirror images of one another, which, which suggests that May is, in the projection booth, also aroused by a male version of herself, a figure of violence and destruction. In fact, May is at first instructed, as you just saw, to put out her cigarette before entering the projection booth. Otherwise, the sensitive nature of the nitrate stock could cause the theater to go up in flames. More than any of the other films being addressed here, and in a manner typical of Lang, Clash by Night does not simply suggest a world of the dead and dying, in Cirque, the obsession with entombment, 
of being buried alive or in Siodmak with masochism and suicidal gestures. Clash by Night, even while it perpetually makes connections between human beings and the natural world, also suggests that what is beyond all this, the next logical, next logical step, is oblivion, negation, no images at all, as everything goes up in flames. People believe in nothing. Nothing, Jerry's father announces at the beginning of the film. In conclusion, however, I want to put Stanwyck back into the position of being an enraptured spectator and return to the film with which this talk began, All I Desire, and what you're going to be seeing in about five minutes. Uh, it's not Naomi's homecoming that I want to briefly uh, conclude with uh, and, and talk about here, um, but the sequence in which Naomi, it's a bit later in the film, which Naomi goes to see her teenage daughter in a high school play, um, and she attends this with her husband and son. This sequence and the intensity with which Naomi observes her daughter would appear to contradict my argument that the role of the spectator is increasingly problematized in these later German Hollywood films of Stanwyck's. But the enchantment Naomi experiences here is entirely bound up with a set of ironic mirroring relationships between Naomi as a spectacle in and for the audience, far greater than that of the play itself, and her daughter on stage. Even more than Norma's introductory sequence in There's Always Tomorrow, the dialogue in the sequence is riddled with references to time and to the act of looking including the dialogue within the play itself. By virtue of Norma's presence in the audience, the space of the viewer is also the space of performance and spectacle, even as the backstage area becomes a space for viewing the spectacle of Naomi in the audience. It's as though Naomi is reborn as an actress by observing her young daughter, and also reborn as a viewer, spellbound by what she sees. But then Naomi says, in her voiceover narration, something revealing. She says, as she's watching the daughter, and with training, she could develop into an actress. So here we have this character unable to fulfill her maternal function by nurturing Lily through childhood. Naomi now has a chance to do so in another way, more consistent with her chosen profession. But Naomi is also beginning to think like a director or acting coach or mature on scène, with the potential to take her daughter and shape, nurture this raw talent to transform her daughter into a kind of image of herself. What one is able to see with a particular clarity in Stanwyck's German Hollywood films is how her flexible technique and screen presence could allow itself to so easily reflect the concerns of these artists at a particular moment in history. Stanwyck's deep melancholy served as the mirror image of a group of exiled filmmakers seeing itself in this otherwise very American actress who so evocatively became, in these films, the star, the viewer, and the co-creator. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joe. So just the, how we do the evening is that we're going to have a five-minute break now, and then we're going to screen the 16mm print of All I Desire, and then Joe will, will return for, for question and answer discussion with you. Okay, so we'll take a break now. Thanks. The question I, I'll pose to you just to get the discussion going is, um, do you think other other than you know what we can actually study in the evidence on the screen of her performance do 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 we know much about her own craft like her own approach to to the craft of acting you know is, is it are, you a, are you asking if she had a school or a, um, a particular concrete method that we can yeah point towards? or do we know much about not her? really not yeah. really it was almost a kind of uh, I wouldn't say it's intuitive and she was I mean there were several figures on the New York stage. Uh, in the 20s that she worked with rather than, say, studied with exactly in a kind of conventional sense. Uh, but it was more a question of having certain kind of innate skills, having them developed by working with certain kinds of directors and actors, first in New York, uh, and then coming to Hollywood. Obviously, Capra, again, is, is the key early figure for her. So, no, she doesn't really have uh, a school, I think, of acting that we can confidently attach a label to. 
It's, it's so striking with uh, her work with, with certain gestures, like, for instance, in the double indemnity clip you showed and the wonderful way that when she sits in the chair, she sits right over one side of the chair and then when she gets up and she gets back down and back into the same position. And is your, is your sense, of course, we can only speculate, is it her sense that, you know, she was involved in creating those kinds of gestures that are so unusual that she herself would have thought of this well you know perhaps not only by herself but do you think she was a co-creator to use that term of, of... i would say so simply because it's complicated because we tend to think of actors as co-creators as being actors who arrive on the set or have predetermined ideas that are quite often in conflict with directors mm. i don't think she ever worked uh in that manner at all there's i would say almost a kind of uh intuitive a combination of intuitive sense and 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 just a very strong uh innate intelligence in terms of what the project is about uh how to insinuate herself into the nature of mm. uh of incredibly diverse body of work mm. to switch from uh billy wilder and double indemnity to uh an anthony Mann western like the furies to this film uh to 40 guns to the lady eve to meet john doe it's an incredibly varied body of work uh, and there's a re remarkable adaptability here. I don't can't think of any other actor, really, male or female, who has that ability to somehow reflect the film and, mm. and embody it. Let's let's open it up to the crowd here. Have some people got comments or, or questions they would like to put to Joe? What did you think of the ending? Oh, there you are. <laughs> you didn't expect it. What were you expecting? I thought she would she she would go back to New York. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was very surprised. The, uh, the it's based on a novel called Stopover, and that's exactly what Naomi does. She comes back to the small town, realizes uh, that it's nothing has changed, and that she just needs to leave once again. Uh, Cirque for years said that. W should have been the ending to the film as well, that this woman comes back to her hometown hoping to uh, find some kind of rejuvenation and instead finds that nothing has changed, and so she goes back uh, to where she came from. Uh, the, the studio and the producer of the film, Ross Hunter, did not want that ending. They wanted a happy ending. They insisted on it. Um, but when Cirque saw the film, apparently much later, again, uh, he thought this ending was that, that stopover ending, that she leaves, uh, was too bleak for Naomi, considering that Naomi has completely run out of options by this point. There's nowhere for her to go, really. Uh, back to being the bottom of a you know of a theatrical bill somewhere, being uh, <coughs> a stooge in, in, in vaudeville routines and so on. This is too despairing, he thought. Uh, and uh, uh, so this, in later years, he seemed to be reconciled to at least. Uh, that it was less despairing for Naomi. Does anybody, because there have been arguments, but much of the literature on the film also sides essentially with Cirque, uh, that this ending is a bit of a compromise. Um, did anybody here see it as not being a compromise? Does it seem like a fully achieved ending? Exactly. Why is she back? She's got. There's nothing left. It's such a question implicitly posed by the film. Had she been a great success as an actress, would she have bothered coming back at all? I mean, Cirque films have this strange quality. To, I mean, uh, for me, a Cirque ending doesn't. It's totally relevant. Where it's a happy ending or a sad ending. There's there's a way in which every at the ending every Cirque film, you feel like no matter what you do in life, no matter what choices you make there was going to be this ambivalence, this sense that somehow you could never be fully happy in relation to any kind of environment you're living in, no matter what particular choices you're going to make. There's going to be something incomplete, something dissatisfying about what you do, where you decide to live, who you decide to marry. Uh, about the course of the film, just the way Cirque handles the direction of the actors, when everybody makes a decision about something. And you get, for example, when... Uh, uh, Henry and, and, and Naomi tell the family, tell the two girls and, and the maid, the cook, that 
uh, she's going to stay now. She's not going to go away. Everyone has a completely different response to that decision. Uh, the one daughter is very un- is extremely unhappy. The uh, uh, the one who wants to be an actress. The other daughter is also unhappy, but for a very different reason. The maid is just taken, or the cook is just taken aback. Her plans to get married now will be complicated, and so on. Uh, so, what one person's happiness is going to be is going to be a source of unhappiness for somebody else. It's an amazing film of interlocking patterns, isn't it? Like of the mirrorings and echoes, and literally in a single shot, sort of inside the house, outside the house, different levels of the house, uh, and you know there are some characters where there's you know whatever six six people arranged in in the depth and in the architectural plan of the shot. It's uh, and every time it's it's full of exactly these kinds of comparisons and echoes, and as you say, happiness for some, unhappiness for others. It's such like, I mean, there's a happy ending here, but there's so much unresolved material in this film uh, even with the happy ending lily's future what she's just sort of it's not really addressed uh, what lily will do next um poor sarah seems to be just left hanging and obviously she's going to be completely shut out of this this entire situation because of uh, of naomi coming back um uh What's the the little boy and his hero who is you know the the lover? I mean, how's the little boy meant to react to you know these heroes in, in hospital now? Uh, and some actually see that Dutch uh, is possibly implicitly the biological father uh, of the boy. Uh, they're linked mm. from the very beginning, and he seems to take after his father, his biological father here, than than the man he calls dad. Uh, but that's something that's not. Made terribly explicit, but I think uh, uh, through the mise en scene, yeah. Cirque certainly indicates often enough that this is uh, quite a possibility. <laughs> And there's that whole, all that fascinating stuff with the uh, her eldest daughter, where they're they're rivals and almost reverse positions, in that the daughter has sort of become the mother of the family, and then when right. when Naomi returns, she's she's like the rebellious daughter of the family. At first, you're so clearly sad to see Lily as the double for uh, for Naomi, and to see the other daughter as as the opposite, taking after the father. But clearly. She's also as much like her mother. She replaces the mother, assumes the maternal function. Mm-hmm. And then she, when Naomi is there, she, uh, Naomi, in a sense, becomes a better version of her daughter in terms of her relationship with the boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking how mysterious uh, the, the concept of, of courage is, the theme of courage that's often announced, like, yeah, you know, I have no principles, you have no courage, that, that, that great exchange. And how the question of courage comes up a lot in the film, like what... What will you dare to do at a particular moment? Will the husband dare to confront the, you know, the lover and so on? Yeah, I mean, Naomi does bring this, I would say, positive force into the family and into the community in a way. Uh, you could almost say, well, she's failed as an actress professionally. However, she's come back to this town and brought this actress's uh, philosophy of life uh, into the community and reinvigorated. And I think the relationship with the brother Priggish daughter uh, is, is a case in point. Uh, loosen up, girl. You know, don't be so tight uh, about everything. Uh, and as her father says, you know, the end, don't be like me. You'll be yeah. very unhappy. Yeah. Some other, some other questions from the audience? Some other questions about Stan Wick's other work that, uh, that you're interested to ask, Joe? Uh, Sorry, Wrong Number is uh, not a film that quite fits in with this sort of... uh, It's it's a bit of an anomaly as well. She's an upper-class woman. Um, uh, She's not quite spectator in that film either, even though she's bedridden. She's on the phone the entire time, and she's trying to create some kind of narrative. Crime of Passion, Garrett Oswald, is a film that would fit perfectly into this. Uh, uh, a pattern I'm trying to lay out here. I didn't include Crime of Passion in the presentation today, but at some point, because I want to publish this into something else uh, a bit uh, a bit more ambitious, and Crime of Passion will fit into this. Uh, if, I, if I start explaining Gerd Oswald, and, and does he actually fit in with this group or not? Because he was born in Germany, but he came as a teenager with his father, uh, only worked in the States, but it seems to me that a film like Crime of Passion is fully of a piece 
uh, with what I've been laying out here uh, all day. I don't know if you've seen Crime of Passion. You obviously have, but uh, it's an absolutely remarkable film where she gives up her career as a reporter to become the wife of, uh, of a policeman. And then once that happens, it's just this intolerable situation of her sitting around with these other housewives and talking about recipes and, and being a standard 50s wife, and she can't take it. She gets becomes physically ill and, and so uh, becomes a kind of criminal um, as a kind of response to to being better to be a criminal than a housewife. <laughs> it's a totally fantastic film, uh, no, no question about that. And, and it's one of those films uh, uh, where... Like the film is, uh, like like All I Desire, Crime and Fashion, is such a ruthlessly sort of economical film, like like so, so you know, intensely yeah. and tightly drawn, yeah. and which is another thing that her acting goes well with. You know, sometimes right. we think of the, the virtue of great actors is that, is that they slow the film down, that, you know, they the, their their face or close-ups or whatever take the film out of its plot line. Mm-hmm. But but with Sandwich, she can be totally of a piece with, with an extremely driving economical plot. And I think even just these, between All I Desire and the clips I showed you tonight from Double Indemnity, there, being metallic almost in the performance mm-hmm. to something like you have in All I Desire... Uh, this the just this adaptability to uh, yeah. uh, just radically different characters and radically different film environments. I mean, she's a gift for cinema. That's quite uh, quite remarkable. Uh, the scene with the son uh, on the bed is uh, uh, quite devastating. The scene when she watches her daughter in the play, I think, is also just just quite devastating. Yeah, she does very. Li- if you look closely, for example, in the scene with the when she's watching the daughter in the play, she's doing very little. I mean, the head is just very slightly tilting. The mouth is slightly open. A bit of drops in the eyes, I think. Uh, and that's about it. Mm. In fact, I even noticed in, in a, several of the, of the clips you used and also in All I Desire that obviously she does certain a shot where she just, like, freezes, as it were, yeah. and, and gives a look, which in itself is, is a very simple look. It's not, a, it's not an overly emotive look. It's just like a simple look. And the directors or the editors of the films like this shot so much that they'll kind of return to it, even illogically, right. even if the actors have slightly moved, they come back to that master shot of her absolute sort of concentrated look because mm-hmm. it works so well yeah. uh, as, as a crystallisation of, of, of a key point of the scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. Anything else? <clears throat> I was just thinking of, of the ending, since you raised the question of the ending, I was thinking of the ending of this film in comparison to uh, All That Heaven Allows, which is also a Ross Hunter uh, dictated happy ending, uh, which feels more like an add-on to me. More like a, uh, an add-on? Like, yeah. like an add-on. All like, like add-on. Yeah, yeah. It's, it feels more like the conventionally dictated uh, happy ending even though you know there are some misreadings about what the deer means, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's where it sort of returns to his uh, Ponovskian origins because the deer is really the animal that carries away evil. And so it's not an ironic comment. He is sort of affirming the logic of the scene. He's trying to do it the best way he can. Um, but but in this film, it's actually Barbara Stanwyck who carries it. Um, and, and it's entirely plausible because of her. Yes. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to comment on that. But her her as, a, as a character or as the, perfor- as the as, actress? As a performer. As a performer. Um, so you're talking about just iconographically she carries something the way the deer was and all the heaven allows? Or is there something about the entire, the summation of everything she does? in the film so that when you get to the happy ending yeah i mean i think perhaps because on the one hand she's the performance she gives she has this complete transparency one moment and openness when she comes home and she watches the family from the windows the doors and so on and this need this desire to go back in to step back into that house is uh, overwhelming. There's no sense of, oh, God, I'm back. I don't want to be back. She really wants to step inside that home and be part of that family again. However, when anything arises briefly, especially with Joyce, the older daughter, the hardness can be like she can just respond immediately to a Joyce. And uh, and you see the defensive forces immediately able to uh, 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 group at that moment, uh, regroup at that moment, come together and uh, um, protect yourself. 
uh, at certain moments. Um, and you see, actually, I think at those moments how Naomi, Naomi survived for those 10 years uh, on her own, working with very little, going from pawn shop to pawn shop, as she says it. Um, uh, so I, I think it's perhaps this, uh, the rapidity, I would say, with which Stanwyck can move from this kind of transparency and emotional directness to a kind of hardness or a kind of uh, pragmatic bitterness, shall we say, uh, and then back again, that also allows for something like the happy ending to not feel like pure, unadulterated sentiment. It almost feels like earned sentiment, shall we say, by the end. This woman has been through a lot. Uh, she's now whatever age she is, mid-40s perhaps. Um, there's not much else she can do right now except stay behind with this family. Uh, it's not awful, and it's not magnificent. It is what it is. And, and, you know, and part of how I res respond to your, your comment, Vincent, is that, as you're saying, in all that heaven allows, there's a sort of displacement from the human to, to an animal, like as, as a sort of a figure or a, an icon or an image to end the film. Here, of course, you know, we, we kind of stay with the humans, with the human story. And then maybe the third part of that uh, triptych would be There's Always Tomorrow, the subsequent Cirque film, which is a much bleaker film, you know, a much more despairing film in which there are a lot of motifs of sort of like almost erasure of, of the human character, or erasure of Stanwyck's character and McMurray's character. And Yeah, I think you have a clear sense of the, There's Always Tomorrow that, that this is... The decisions these two characters have made, Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray, they love each other, they want to be together, it's impossible because he's married now, and he wants to leave his wife, she says, no, 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 you can't, you have to stay with them. She goes back to New York, he stays in Los Angeles, and he stays with his wife and children. There is, on the surface, a happy ending to that film, but I think there's no question in terms of the way the scenes are played, that we have two incredibly unhappy, miserable individuals. Uh, at the end of the film. I don't think you sense that uh, from the resolution to this film. I mean, they've made real sacrifices and there's always tomorrow uh, for some larger social, not even social good, just a social facade, you might yeah, say. Yeah. yeah. Yes, there, there's less sense. Far we need less to do, sense this is what is expected of us. We must do it. Uh, it, uh, it will not make us happy, but this is what we must do. Whereas I think in All I Desire, you can sense that Cirque, you know, he did have some love for Americana as, as, as a true thing, not as right. a superficial thing, you know, not as a birthday cake kind right. of facade, but that he, you know, he really, he wanted to believe in some, you know, deep dish American values and, and he does invest, you know, some, some authenticity in them. What do you think of the cook? <laughs> uh, authentic or... My favorite will be the guy with the Swedish accent in the beginning. So. <laughs> it's a very beautiful Swedish accent. Yeah. And it's so great that scene where he says, you know, cancel the card, you know, after he's been. <laughs> That's terrific. Just this wonderful yeah. parallel of this Here's, here's someone who wanted, be... waiting, waiting years yeah. to get married uh, until yeah. the children grow up and with this reuniting of Naomi uh, and her husband. Mm. Her staying will be bad news for him. <laughs> Well, I think we may have reached the oh, end of... Yes, uh, we have another? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to come back to... Oh, oh God. okay, thank you. I just wanted to come back to that I, um, idea you mentioned about um, Stanwyck kind of being tired of being on the outside looking in. And in this film, she's, of course, not the only character who is in that position. Also, um, Butch is... Butch? Butch? Um, him? Yeah, he's out, the <laughs> yes. one who's outside the house. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and um, I think it's a very interesting character in the way that, first of all, she, he's kind of represented as a villainous figure, yeah. um, stylistically, but also there is this kind of idea that I don't think he wants to be on the inside as much as he doesn't want to be on the outside alone. Yeah, and he definitely does not, yeah. unlike Naomi, he doesn't want to make that passage over into the home, uh, into that bourgeois environment. He wants this bourgeois character to come out uh, and be with him. Uh, they, they always meet outdoors uh, in the film. They never meet even close to the home. And even the signal from the past that we hear about is, you know, I sh I'll shoot off the gun, you leave the house, and you come out and you meet me somewhere uh, outdoors. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's it's key that he's this outsider who's always, who wants to be an outsider on some level. You know, no desire to, uh, no ambivalence there at all, just 
rebels, you might say, in his status as something of a, 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 a loner rebel, shall we say, in the town. But he's also an extraordinarily static character in that he completely lives in the past. You know, like the, the past that he keeps saying, you know, you're back. You know, the, the past has never gone away. You know, we can relive all of that now because it never ended. Right. And there's something kind of pathetic about that, how, you know, I mean, he can't change, you know, unless he gets shot. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, she says we can't we can't go back and, and, and yeah, relive yeah. the past. He says, why not, you know. Uh, mm. She has she since moved on. Doesn't he make for an interesting comparison with the Rock Hudson character in All That Heaven Allows? In what because sense? In in that Rock Hudson sort of uh, incarnates uh, also the, the, the you know an alternative to the bourgeois small town life, but it's uh, portrayed in a much more positive light. Uh, he represents the kind of New England transcendentalist spirit, whereas this guy is just a. Uh, the negative force, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's 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 one of the gunslinging, uh, ick type, the Wisconsin model. Then all that heaven allows the woman is totally the bourgeoisie. That's the whereas Naomi is this girl from the wrong side of the tracks originally a working class. You don't ever hear much else about her background except that she is, in marrying Henry, she moves up in class, but somehow can't ever fully adapt to this. Um, I mean, among the many unresolved things at the end of the film is what, what next? As Henry then presumably left his job. Um, and the t community has clearly not changed. So what will they do next? Fight the community alone? Move away? Uh, so change has occurred, but there are all these, again, more unresolved questions that, uh, uh, that, the, that the ending does not uh, really deal with. So the ending is actually stranger, more unresolved uh, than it might seem to be on the surface. Yeah. Apparently there was a, a budgetary crisis on the film while they were in production. They were supposed to shoot several scenes uh, that would fill in, including the graduation ceremony that they keep talking about and you never see. That, that was originally planned to be filmed and then they just scrapped it. And apparently that graduation scene was going to bring together and resolve certain issues in terms of Sarah, in terms of Lily and so on. Uh, and it was just never shot. Uh, presumably, there's a, there was a script for it. I don't know if it exists yeah. at the Universal, if there are Universal archives somewhere. But I don't know anybody's ever done the the legwork on this to find out what was scripted. But uh, it strangely works by being so unresolved. Yeah. Okay. Other where are they? Uh, does Universal house their material? Ah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Margaret Herrick Library, library that's yeah, where I thought, yeah. Okay, I, I think we have now come to our uh, natural ending, so please thank... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our resolved ending, so please thank Joe. And thank you for coming.